Pisistratus died in 527 with all his uh, power, uh, and so far as we know, peacefully, and was succeeded in the tyranny uh, over Athens by his uh, sons, by his first wife, Hippias, who was the elder, and Hipparchus. I think it's, it's reasonable to think, it's proper to think of Hippias as the man in charge. Uh, but Hipparchus shared a considerable amount of his uh, power and responsibility. At first, it appears that they ruled in the same way that their father had, which was to say one that was uh, moderate and uh, didn't cause a great deal of uh, opposition in Athens. And it, of course, there always was a certain amount of opposition. We should not forget that. Aristocratic families always vying for their own power and their own position were uncomfortable very often under uh, Pisistratus, and different ones, different families got into trouble and were driven out. And our old friends, the Alcmeonidae, got into trouble again, were banished <coughs> in the time of the uh, sons of Pisistratus, and it was necessary to, for, to have um, a battle against them in which they were defeated and driven out. That will play a significant role in the future of Athens quite soon. But I think it's in the year 514 that a very important event changes the course of things. There is a personal quarrel between the tyrants, one of the tyrants actually, and one of the noble young men, which results in a plot to kill both Hippias and Hipparchus, led by two young men who will become known in Athenian lore as the Tyrannicides, because in their plot they succeed in killing the younger brother Hipparchus, although they don't get Hippias. They themselves are killed. The plot fails. But its significance, I think, comes in the fact that it made Hippias thereafter very nervous, very concerned about his safety and about the future of his regime. And the nature of the regime, according to tradition, changes, and it becomes very harsh. And there are uh, persecutions of people who are suspected of perhaps plotting or hoping to plot against the tyranny. And that's significant. And it's a characteristic event, as I told you early on, as I spoke about tyranny in general. Usually in the second, and sometimes if they made it to the third, there would be opposition. The opposition would make the rulers nervous. The nervous rulers would then misbehave and create further opposition. And that's the story as it happens in Athens. One wrinkle in the Athenian story is that the um, Alcmeonidae, who had been expelled from the city, always active, always thinking, um, became, uh, got into a position of a special favor to the Delphic Oracle when there was a, an earthquake that badly damaged the temple of Apollo at Delphi. The uh, Alcmeonidae bid for the contract to rebid, uh, rebuild the uh, temple, and in the doing of that, they spent some of their own money to make the temple even more beautiful than the contract required, which put them in great favor with the priests of Delphi, and they immediately cashed this favor in, in the form of seeking their own political advantage. The story, as Herodotus tells it, is that uh, their goal was to drive out Hippias from Athens, and the way to do it this time, remember they've tried every trick in the world and it hasn't really worked, and the idea now is to turn to the most powerful military state in Greece and use it for their purposes. I'm talking, of course, about Sparta. And the tale is that whenever the Spartans sent a message to the Delphic Oracle asking for the opportunity to consult the Oracle, the answer that came back was, first, free the Athenians. Well, whether that was the reason or he had reasons of his own, the very ambitious king of Sparta, King Cleomenes, was going to undertake the job of removing Hippias from power in Athens quite soon. Um, 
It's in the year uh, 511-10 that the Spartans under Cleomenes will invade Attica, uh, gain control of the state, and remove Hippias and withdraw. But we'll come back to that story in just a moment. Let me conclude our uh, consideration of the Athenian tyranny <coughs> by looking at what were the achievements and consequences <coughs> of the years of tyrannical rule. Many positive elements, as was so often the case with tyranny. From the economic side, this was a period of great expansion of Athenian commerce, trade. Very strong to the east through the Hellespont and to the Black Sea, but also in this period, Athens trades very strongly with the West, I mean to say chiefly Sicily and Italy. And in fact, up to that point, up to those years, roughly speaking, Corinthian pottery, fine Corinthian pottery, is dominant in the Western areas, is no surprise. That's always been the case for Corinth. But by the end of the, of the sixth century, Athenian pottery has actually outstripped it in the Western markets, which show you how much this combination of trade, industry, uh, was changing the character of Athens and making it wealthier and bringing along various elements that, of change in their way of life. Another consequence of the uh, tyrannical experience in Athens was a diminution in the power of the aristocracy. And this, again, the general story wherever we see tyranny in the Greek world. It never erases aristocracy. You never see the disappearance of the distinction between nobles and commoners and claims to the aristocracy of birth and descent from the gods. It, it's always there. And even in the most democratic of Athenian, of Greek states, like Athens, for instance, it did, uh, uh, aristocracy doesn't go away. It's not abolished. It lives side by side <coughs> with a democratic constitution. But the, do the domination by the aristocracy, the monopoly of all the powers and influence that they used to have, it's not there. And that is a tremendously important consequence. So that when <coughs> the tyranny goes away, <coughs> and it's necessary to reconstruct a new Athenian constitution, the answer will not simply be a return to the old days before the tyrants. <clears throat> Solon had intervened in an important way, and the tyrants had made their contribution too to changes that turned out to be permanent. It's uh, also true that uh, under the tyrants, <clears throat> the local power of the um, noblemen had been reduced and the power of the government in Athens, which was not dominated by the aristocracy but by the tyrants, that was a trend and one of the issues that would have to be worked out would be what would be the relationship between the localities outside of Athens and the city itself. Localism has been damaged <coughs> but not abolished. If there are going to be new forms of government that take place, one of the consequences, one of the things, I should say, one of the precursors of that will be to further strengthen the center and weaken the periphery and to continue to uh, strip as best one could the influence and power of the aristocracy which was mainly to be felt in the countryside and to increase the power of some other form of government, uh, which center would be in Athens. On the other hand, because of the reforms of Solon, which I remind you, <coughs> Pisistratus and his sons allowed to stay in place, at least in the formal sense, uh, because therefore every year, think about it, uh, people were elected archon, people were chosen for a council, law courts operated, all of these things not dominated by the aristocracy, but really in the case of the magistracies, uh, the um, wealth was the criterion, remember, ever since Solon, so that people who were not aristocrats but were wealthy also participated in those jobs. And the council, which was open to three out of the four Athenian classes under Solon, 
meant that people actually went to the council chamber, participated in decisions about what was going on, to be sure they weren't going to do anything that the tyrants didn't want. But 90, 95 percent of the time, maybe more, the tyrant didn't care. <clears throat> so that they were getting, this is the point I really want to stress, they were getting experience in the business of self-government. And when you do that, <clears throat> I think the history of the world shows <clears throat> that once people <clears throat> have risen to that state where they do participate in their own self-government, it's very hard to get them back into a state when they don't anymore. That's going to be very difficult to make stick. Athens has been moved down the road to, uh, to self-government as a consequence, strangely enough, of the tyranny. Just in passing, I might point out, that's not a unique phenomenon. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Uh, to look back at the early post-colonial age in, in the 20th century and to see that there were real differences between colonies that had been ruled in a, I, would, I don't want to say tyrannical way, but in, a, in an absolute way, such as the Congo uh, or other places like that, as opposed to places that had achieved some degree of self-government even while they were ruled by a European power, the, the difference was very great. The, uh, once you've, the same experience that I'm talking about now that led to uh, the capacity and a determination to govern oneself was more likely in places where there had been some such thing. India, of course, is a striking example where the Indians had managed to achieve some degree of participation in the government of their own state under the British, who, in spite of all the troubles they had, have actually produced a functioning, relatively democratic government in that great subcontinent. Well, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so, knowing what we now know, looking backward, it is possible to say it looks like the tyranny played a very important role in the transition from aristocratic government to democracy. That's not what the tyrants intended. They intended to rule for as long as they could, but it was one of the consequences, as we will see. <clears throat> well, let's turn once again to those Alcmeonidae who had, as you remember, a checkered past in Athens and even under the tyranny because they had been driven out. You remember Megacles had, <clears throat> had his deal with uh, Pisistratus had broken that, uh, Pisistratus had broken that deal, so he went into opposition. He and the Alcmeonidae were driven out, but they came back <coughs> because we find Cleisthenes' name on the uh, list of archons, uh, but then they had been driven out again. <coughs> and in the year 511-10, Cleisthenes, who was leader of the Alcmeonid family <coughs> and political faction, was in exile <coughs> and was working to get the Spartans to do the job that was done. So Cleomenes takes his Spartan army in, in 510, he drives out the tyrants, <clears throat> and then he goes home. Now the question that confronts the Athenians is, what form of government should we have? And again, there's, there's a whole range of possibilities, not a whole range, there are a few possibilities. That one would be reactionary. <clears throat> Let's go back to the days before Solon, when the aristocracy was everything. There certainly, as we will see, were people who wanted to do something very much like that. <clears throat> On the other hand, what are you going to do about all these people of consequence who are wealthy and who have made it to the top but who are not aristocrats? And then what are you going to do about all of these family farmers <clears throat> of whom there must be more now than ever because of uh, the, uh, my suggestion that Pisistratus had taken away land from some uh, exiled aristocrats <clears throat> and distributed it among uh, families, some of whom were successful on farms and became hoplite soldiers and uh, independent farmers, they're not going to be enjoy being put back to a position which was worse than they had under the tyranny. Because <clears throat> under the tyranny they were <clears throat> sitting on councils and participating in these things, sitting in courts, and now they, they were going to be take, all this was going to be taken away if the <clears throat> reactionary <clears throat> aristocracy had its way. That was really what the contest was, I think. <clears throat> should should uh, we continue with the Salonian constitution, only without tyrants, <clears throat> or should we go back to an aristocracy? 
And the contest for how to decide that was done in the usual old-fashioned way, that is to say, in the contest for the archonship. <clears throat> the candidates on, of holding one view ran against candidates holding the other view, and that's where the matter would be decided. Be decided. But they went at it in the old way, that is, the decisions were being made in the political clubs that belonged to the aristocracy. <clears throat> in other words, how we're going to do this was being fought out in the, um, with, among the aristocrats, not among the public at large. And in that contest, Cleisthenes, who stood <clears throat> for the more moderate, for the Salonian, let us say, <clears throat> approach, as his family had always done, <clears throat> lost. <clears throat> the winner was a man called Isagoras, <clears throat> an aristocrat, they were all aristocrats of course, <clears throat> and um, he uh, engages, the, I should say by the way, we're talking now, th this, con this uh, election takes place after a <clears throat> preliminary pushing back and forth in the year 5087. And he, his victory, <clears throat> means a victory for the reactionary program. And one of the, his first actions is to establish still another council, not the council of 400 that um, Solon had established, but a new council of 300, and it was to be made up only of aristocrats. <clears throat> Second, very interesting, and it turns out very important change introduced by <clears throat> Isagoras, <clears throat> was to scrutinize the citizens list <clears throat> and then to remove from that list lots and lots of people who were deemed to be, uh, I guess to say, illegally enrolled in the citizen list. They were now going to impose retroactively <clears throat> the traditional criterion for Athenian citizenship. Is your father an Athenian citizen. <clears throat> but we know <clears throat> that <clears throat> Solon had already broken through that by permitting people to come to Athens and to acquire citizenship if they had the necessary skills, and there surely had been a fair number of those. And we are told <clears throat> that the Pisistratids had done the same thing for pretty much the same reason. <clears throat> So over a, a couple of generations, you had foreigners coming to Athens and acquiring Athenian citizenship and undoubtedly using it, <clears throat> who were now going to be <clears throat> disenfranchised and driven from the citizen lists. Now, that made for quite a few discontented people in Athens. If you, if you pick the moment after which <clears throat> Isagoras has accomplished these two things. That is, establishing the Council of 300, which is obviously going to be the governing body in Athens, an aristocratic council, and driven <clears throat> X number of people from the citizen lists, then all of those people are going to be very unhappy, and very likely they have friends who are also going to be unhappy. So you have <clears throat> a situation which is by no means calm and settled, but it might have settled down as people, as they usually do when things are <clears throat> unavoidable, when the, there is no real option, nobody is making a different case, they would have just gotten used to things, I suppose. But now Cleisthenes decides to do things differently. He does not <clears throat> accept his defeat as he would have had to do in the old days, having been defeated in the aristocratic contest. Instead, in the words of uh, Herodotus, pros et ton daemon. He brought the people into his political faction. The root of that first word, pros eridzitai, is hetairia, which means a club, a political club, a collection of companions. Uh, that's the name for these aristocratic societies, and, and, and Cleisthenes broke the rules. He went out there beyond the aristocratic circle, and he recruited people, you become part of my political faction. Well, why should they? Because he had a program <clears throat> that was contrary to the one pursued by Isagoras. <clears throat> 
It's one that will result, when it is successful, uh, in the establishment of what pretty much everybody agrees was the first <coughs> Athenian democracy. The reforms that he uh, proposed then, we, we have to imagine he actually went around and electioneered, that was not done before that, <coughs> and persuaded people to support him in his programs. And then he put his programs through. Well, where did he put these programs through? He surely couldn't have done that <coughs> in the Council of 300. It would never have passed, <coughs> and he, I'm sure he didn't try. Instead, he acted, I think, as though there was no Council of 300. He did what you would have done if you wanted to propose a bill prior to that. You would go, you would go to the assembly, which was the Salonian assembly, and which had the right to pass laws. No doubt, <coughs> it only passed laws that the Pisistratids wanted, but it was not something new. It was something people were accustomed to, and he went to the assembly, and he proposed his laws, and they were passed. Well, Isagoras still had the whip hand, and he wasn't going to sit still while that took place. And so, using the force at his disposal, <coughs> he drove Cleon, uh, oh, I'm sorry, as a matter of fact, the force that was at, was at his disposal was that of King Cleomenes and the Spartans, who came back again when called back. No doubt what Cleomenes had in mind when he did what he had done originally, driving out the Pisistratids, was the establishment of an aristocratic republic in Athens with his friends being in charge. That's what the Spartans typically would do if they could. So he was shocked and annoyed, I'm certain, when he hears his friends have been somehow pushed out of power and some newfangled kind of a government that lets ordinary people participate has been instituted. So Cleomenes comes back with his forces and drives Cleisthenes, and we are told, this is an interesting figure, I, I can't promise that it's right, but it does show up in, uh, in, in Herodotus. Um, Cleisthenes and 700 families who must have been in his faction are driven out of, Attica, out of, out of Attica. <clears throat> but the people are not ready to take that. They resist. And they have numbers on their side. <clears throat> and they end up shutting up Cleomenes and his forces, which are not many. We're talking about probably hundreds of soldiers, no more than that. <clears throat> and we must imagine that there are thousands of Athenians out there <clears throat> who are discontent. <clears throat> so they shut Cleomenes up on the Acropolis where he has run for safety uh, with Isagoras at his side. And finally they cut a deal and they go home. And Cleisthenes and his uh, supporters, whom it's fair I think to start calling Democrats, <clears throat> have taken over the city by this coup and are ready to go forward. <clears throat> now, this requires that they establish a new constitution, because they're going to have a regime the like of which no one had ever seen before. <clears throat> but in trying to understand this constitution, and it's not easy, <clears throat> the ancient sources tell us a lot about it, but <clears throat> it's not perfectly clear what's in everybody's mind uh, as they do what they do. Motives, purposes are not clear, as you'll see in a moment. <clears throat> but anyway, what I want you to fix on is this. Don't imagine that what's taking place here is even anything like the American Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, <clears throat> where a bunch of delegates have been selected from here and there, and they all sit and argue with each other over the hot summer, uh, and finally come up with various plans. It's better, I think, to think, if we're using historical analogies to help us, as of course there is nothing better than that to help us. Um, think of the French Revolution. Think of the convention where the sort of the mass of the people have gained control of the situation after driving the king from his uh, uh, throne and uh, after really putting aside a more aristocratic council that came before it. And they sit down with radical people running around ready to kill people. <clears throat> this is the outfit that's going to end up killing the king and his queen and all the aristocrats they can lay their hands on. In other words, we are in a revolutionary situation. 
and <clears throat> their force and terror are in the air. And everybody is oh, fully aware of the danger of this, that, and the other thing, and of, of some dangers that <clears throat> probably don't even exist. We are in a situation that resembles civil war, that could be on the brink of a serious civil war, and added to that, in other words, the Athenians who, are, who will be sitting in the assembly passing the laws that produce the constitution that Cleisthenes favors, <clears throat> are first of all already afraid <clears throat> that the local aristocrats will use force or guile against them. But on top of that, there's been two Spartan invasions of Attica in the last couple of years. And this, there's nothing to stop King Cleomenes from coming back again because he doesn't like the way he's been treated. In fact, I'd go further. I'd say there's every reason to fear that that's going to happen. Again, that's where the analogy to the French Revolution works again because uh, nothing that happens in that uh, the, the most radical period of the French Revolution is understandable if you don't know that the French regularly expect that the, the kings and emperors of uh, Europe will be marching against them with professional armies very soon and their fear is absolutely justified. And so is the Athenian fear that the Spartans will be coming. So it's in that hot environment where fear is all over the place that this new democratic constitution will be shaped. <clears throat> and there's no question that I think that the, the place where it's happening <clears throat> is in the assembly. Uh, the assembly sits, as you, I hope you know, uh, on a hillside in the middle of Athens, uh, on a hill called the Pnyx, and there in the open air, all adult male citizens are eligible <coughs> to participate in what takes place. Uh, one little point I'd also suggest to you is, uh, what about the people who have been thrown off the citizen lists? Are they there? My, no, this is just reasoning, I, we don't have any hard evidence. My, my answer is absolutely they are. Who is going to tell them not to? You show up on the hill, who's going to kick you off? Does Cleisthenes want you kicked out? Hell no, because as we will see, one of his main planks is enrolling those people as citizens. So, in fact, I will bet a lot of money that in all the electioneering that went on about all these different things, they were a group he must have targeted and say, you've been unfairly treated by these aristocrats. If I get in power, I will see to it that you are enrolled again as citizens. So all of that is happening and people are very excited about what is going on. That's the background for these rather dry and puzzling details I'm about to lay on you to try to describe what, this new, what these new laws were that uh, amounted to some kind of a democracy. <clears throat> the center of them, apparently, were reforms of the tribes. And they are in some ways very radical indeed. As you know, these tribes go back before the birth of history. Think of any primitive society you want to. It's likely to be divided up into tribes. <clears throat> The tribes typically are alleged to come from some very ancient times when gods or heroes founded them. That's certainly true of the Greek uh, tribes, where each tribe is named after some heroic figure, some semi-divine figure in the past. So there are four, the four traditional Ionian tribes, and that's why this, what makes it even more radical than anything else, is that Cleisthenes' law changes the tribal system in Athens from four tribes to ten tribes. Absolutely brand new things that have no tradition behind them, nothing, no history or anything. And then he has to give names to these tribes, and in, according to the Greek practice, these tribes have to have um, some founding hero to be named after. So he gets, uh, picks out, I think I'm right in thinking, a hundred names of heroes, and he assigns them to the ten tribes by lot. And now we suddenly have ten new tribes. Now, I mean, if you tr can try to think yourself back to a tribal society and think what a, what a disruptive thing this is. All my life 
I've been a, a, a member of the tribe named after Ion, and so have my ancestors, and so my ancestors. No more. He, he's not around anymore. There's a new tribe that was just invented that I'm a member of. So that's a very surprising thing. But that's not the end of the story. <clears throat> Each tribe now is divided up into three parts. They, the word for a third is tritis, and the plural is tritiase. And here's the point. Each, one of the, each tribe has one of its tritiase in and around the city of Athens. It has <clears throat> another one in the middle of uh, Athens. And it, I'm sorry, in the middle of Attica. And in the third, uh, it is the third of its three regions, sorry, of its, yeah, of its three divisions will be in the region called the coast, the Peralia. So every tribe is geographically distributed across all of Attica in this way. That is something quite new. In the old days, we have to believe that the tribes were geographically separated uh, for regions, for tribes. Um, yeah, the, the uh, city region, the coast region, and the midland region, each one of these regions has 10 tritiates, one for each of the 10 tribes. Now, let's take it a step further. The tritiates themselves, are formed of units that are called demes in English. That's D-E-M-E-S. The Greek word for it is very confusing, is demos. Now, the demos is this deme, this political unit. It also means a village. It also means the whole Athenian people. And it also means only the poor Athenian people. So there you are. But in the context that we're dealing with it here, we, we mean these units that are geographical and have a constitutional function. Uh, there is, however, even here, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, confusion because <clears throat> some of the deans are actually made up of an original village. They don't mess with that. A deem is the equivalent of, a, in other words, a deem is a deem the two different meanings of the word deem. Other deems for the constitutional purpose are made up of a number of villages, so there would be a lot of these old deems placed into the new constitutional deem. The idea, however, is that every tritus must be of the same size in terms of population, because they have, you, your whole idea is to get each tribe to be numerically equal, and that's uh, one reason for that, is because the tribes will be the regiments of the Athenian army. You line up and fight in your, uh, when, the, when you're called to fight in the army, uh, in your, in accordance with your deem, which is located in a certain tradition, and which is, becomes a regiment, of your tribe is a regiment of the uh, army. Now, they uh, get this straight. Now, the deems are unequal in population but the tritiates have to be equal. So that tells you you have to have multiple deems in some and just one or two or a few in another. All right. It is also true that the tritiates are assigned to the tribes by lot. And the thing I want you to remember, I, I want to avoid as much complication as I can, is that it doesn't really matter to the people who invented the Constitution how the deems are assigned to the tritiates, except one scholar has suggested uh, one motive that strikes most of us as very plausible. Made a careful study of how the deems are distributed to the tritiates. Uh, and compared them with where we know there were important religious sites. 
You know, the, the Greek religion uh, has these many gods and deities, and they have local characteristics because there are legends about their having lit on this earth at a certain place or done a deed at another place. So you have a cave of Pan in eastern uh, Ith, uh, Attica, and you have a, a place where Athena did this, that, and the other thing. And <clears throat> the point I'm getting at is, these became shrines, places where the religion was exercised. And in ancient Attica, aristocratic Attica, the aristocrats owned the piece of land on which the shrine was, which meant you had to have their permission to come onto it to worship, which meant that they would have predominance, power, and influence in those, these areas. Well, what this scholar David Lewis was his name, <coughs> concluded was that there are times when, there are more, quite a few times when the thing is laid out in such a way as to decide, the re, divide the religious site on the aristocrat's uh, land from his main dwelling on that land. So the aristocrat is separated from the place where he has religious clout as a way of dividing up his political influence and power. He reads this as a, one of the ways in which Cleisthenes attempted to diminish the power of the aristocracy through its local uh, influence. <clears throat> now this new deem is very, very important. It is the basic unit in the whole system. It takes, it was meant, I should say, to take the place of the fratry, you remember the brotherhood that was the kernel of the old tribal system, it was meant that the fratry, uh, that the deem should be the basic thing. For instance, um, <clears throat> one of the most important things was that your citizenship, according to the laws of Cleisthenes, were no longer, was no longer to be ascertained by going to your fratry, but each deem would keep an official role of the citizens in that deem. So when a, a, an Athenian uh, boy is uh, uh, born, and when he reaches a certain uh, age, he, he, you have to take him to the deem and register him, and now he can be an Athenian citizen. Well, <clears throat> this was one of several things that we see in Cleisthenes' constitution that in which the uh, intention could not be carried out. That is, the fratry and the notion of the fratry as the core of such things was uh, never abolished, would have been out, out, out of the question to abolish it at too many religious associations, and it never really lost its place in the Athenian mind. Yes, your official enrollment as a citizen was in the deem, but there was still a tremendous allegiance to the fratry. So it didn't have its and, uh, and the fratry was still run by aristocrats, so it didn't have its full effect. The deem um, elected an official called a demarch. We could, might call a mayor or whatever the local official is called. Selectmen, we say sometimes still in Connecticut, holding to our colonial traditions. Um, and the deem is also given religious functions and religious rights because everybody knows that religion still is potent, even if you're engaged in a revolution in Athens at the beginning of the fifth century. Um, here's another thing that they tried to do. Cleisthenes tried with a law to change the way in which an Athenian was officially designated. It used to be, before Cleisthenes came along, you ask a man, who are you? He would say, I am Cleisthenes, the son of Megacles, <clears throat> period. Just the patronymic. Just like, you know, uh, you, have, you bear the name of your father, unless you chose to bear the name of your mother, which is evidence of how unAthenian we really are. Um, so um, that's the way it was. But un under the laws of Cleisthenes, henceforth, citizens were to be designated not as Cleisthenes, son of Megacles, but as Cleisthenes from Alopeki, which is to say his deem. 
He was to be the citizen's name and his deem name. It was a direct, uh, people have argued about what the point of all this was, but I think um, <clears throat> one limited point before we get to the full story is simply another way of cutting down the influence of birth in the society. It's a way of damaging the aristocratic principle and asserting in its place, look what's really happening here, that there is something which is the polis that has nothing to do with birth, that is the part of the legal structure which is a polis. It's a whole new concept that's really creeping in here, uh, replacing the old traditional way of organizing society with one <coughs> that is the, the work of citizens coming together and determining how they themselves will be governed. <coughs> All right, F let that be the story of the tribes for a moment. Now, here we go with another council. <coughs> You've heard about the Council of 400. You've heard about the Council of 300. We can do better than that. We're going to have a Council of 500. It will be the council that is the democratic council for the remainder of the history of the Athenian democracy, with the exception of short periods of <coughs> uh, oligarchic rebellion that remove it, but it comes back when the democracy does. <coughs> and that council, let me simply describe it very briefly, <coughs> it is open to all Athenian adult male citizens. <coughs> Membership on the council comes through uh, some combination of allotment and election. Uh, <coughs> the, um, um, the, point of, the point of it is that an assembly <coughs> of thousands is not well equipped to conduct all kinds of business that has to be conducted for the state, and even its own business. You need a small group <coughs> to uh, prepare the agenda for a full assembly meeting. And so that was the function of the 500. It is, and this is very important, one of those very democratic elements. <clears throat> the assembly, of course, is totally democratic because all adult male citizens participate if they wish. <clears throat> but <clears throat> you can easily get around that in some degree if you have a, <clears throat> a council or a little group that actually determines what's going to happen. From the first, it wasn't so. The, the um, members of the council had to be, um, I'm sorry, the, um, the council itself was as democratic as the assembly. And so uh, we'll come back to that council later on, but there it is in place. <clears throat> Another thing that happened, not in 5087, <clears throat> but a few years down the road, but still in the same period, was that by now, the, the army of Athens, which originally had been led simply by the polemarch, the archon who was chosen for the military leadership, <coughs> had given way to generals who commanded the different tribes. And it used to be that each tribe <coughs> elected its own general. But in the new system, now each tribe, sorry, back up, the entire people elected the generals for each of the tribes. In other words, the 10 tribes still had a general apiece, but the entire population elected him. Usually, he came from the tribe that he was asked to command, but not always. And again, this, you can see what the point of this is. <clears throat> it has the same characteristic as so much of what we are describing. It is going to reduce particularism localism, and make the whole people, the whole demos and their representative institutions be the decisive element in the state. And that is one of the things that uh, we'll be getting to right next, to ask ourselves, what's going on here <coughs> and why is it happening? <coughs> and here's where our sources, uh, I'll tell you what our sources say, and at the end of the day we have to make some judgments. <coughs> of course. Generally, and I think properly, the source get, who gets the most uh, credence from scholars today is Herodotus, <coughs> who's closer to it in time than, although he's by, you know, I should point out Herodotus is writing his history sometime, or at least he's writing it as late as the
the 420s. But he himself <coughs> goes back to an earlier part of the fifth century, and therefore he is in a position to hear stories from people who go back even into the sixth century, which makes him theoretically a more credible source than people like Aristotle, who I'll be quoting at you, who lives in the fourth century and is uh, a good whole century later <coughs> than Herodotus. But Herodotus is not, of course, himself a witness to any of the facts that he adduces. Anyway, he asks, why did Cleisthenes of Athens do what he did? And his answer is a pretty stale one. He was trying to copy his ancestor, Cleisthenes of Sicyon, who also changed the tribes, you may remember, in Sicyon from <clears throat> the old Dorian tribes to new tribes that uh, designated the wrong people, like I mean to say the Dorians, as swine men and ass men and so on. Uh, uh, and that, that's why Cleisthenes did it. He thought it would be a nice thing to do because his ancestor, his namesake, did the same thing. Well, I don't think we can buy that. We move into a more persuasive territory, I think, when we get to Aristotle, <coughs> who writes in his politics as follows. Perhaps a question rather arises, he's dealing with the whole question of citizenship, about those who had been admitted to citizenship after a revolution had taken place. For instance, such a creation of citizens as that carried out at Athens by Cleisthenes after the expulsion of the tyrants, when he enrolled in his tribes many resident aliens, metics, who had been foreigners and slaves. So here's a new story that we have to add to the picture. I mentioned it in passing, but it's very important. One of the things Cleisthenes does, and he, he has to do it through measures passed through the assembly, uh, is to enfranchise the people who had been thrown off the citizen lists. Um, and uh, one thing that you want to do, and you couldn't have done that, given the uh, nature of the old constitution, if you hadn't broken up the old system of tribes, fratries, and so on, and come up with a new one which would not have the old prejudices against it. So that's part of the story. Again, Aristotle, <coughs> or one of his pupils, there's some dispute about the document that is called Athenaion Politeia, Constitution of Athens, uh, as to whether Aristotle was the uh, composer of that piece or one of his uh, uh, students. Anyway, here's what it says. With the aim of mixing up the population, so that a great number would share in the citizenship, they came up with this phrase, me fulo crinane, do not judge according to tribe. But it goes beyond tribe. It really means do not judge on the basis of birth. Ar Aristotle says it was directed against those who wanted to check on family backgrounds. He goes on to say this new nomenclature, that's what I just mentioned to you before, about your name is now no longer the uh, son of, you are the son of so-and-so, but rather you are of the deem so-and-so. He says, so that they would not, by addressing one another by their father's names, expose the newly enrolled citizens, but would call them by the families of the deems. This passage caused a great deal of puzzle and confusion among scholars who couldn't understand what this is all about. <clears throat> and that's, I think, because the topic was mostly treated by, by the British. But Americans can see this right away. If you were, best way to put it this way, and of course you wouldn't know about this. You live in a country who's absolutely pure and without prejudice according to race or color or ethnic origins or religion. So you won't know what I'm talking about. But let me pass on from an earlier generation, a darker time in which I grew up, in which um, uh, supposing you, you're a, a man who came from uh, the Abruzzi in Italy and your name was uh, Giovanni Di Stefano. That was fine in the Abruzzi. But uh, in America, there were people who didn't have a high opinion of people with such a name. 
and were likely not to be opening their doors or uh, homes to people like that. And so your son, instead of calling himself Giovanni Di Stefano, changed his name to John Stevens. And thereupon, everything was okay. That's the way things were meant to be in Athens. That is to say, the idea was if you had a foreign sounding name, your father would have a foreign sounding name if he came from a foreign place when he settled in Attica, you would be branded in that way. And people who wanted, and here it was more specific, who people who at some time might want to throw you off the citizenship lists would know who you were. But if you took a good, solid Anglo-Athenian name, why, you'd be all right. So I think that is the explanation. And it's all part of the same picture. Taking away the traditional influences that would be anti-democratic and replacing them with uh, things that uh, shattered that and taking away the uh, local powers, anything that smacked of the past, you try to erase as best you can. <clears throat> the procedure, uh, we all agree, is by the device that the Greeks called a psephisma. It was a motion passed by the assembly. And it comes to be the standard form of legislation in the Athenian democracy. The plural of psephisma is psephismata. Now, the scholar who uh, I was alluding to a few moments ago, uh, uh, Lewis, he's got the general picture right. He says, we have to understand all of this was passed on the assembly in a mood of great excitement and fear and anger, uh, a revolutionary situation in which he imagined alluding to the revolution in uh, St. Petersburg in 1917, uh, that they are getting up and shouting, all power to the ten tribes. Uh, to those of you who are not in St. Petersburg, what they were shouting was all power to the Soviets. Uh, but I think he's wrong. It wasn't about the ten tribes. The ten tribes weren't the issue. I think if they were shouting, and I guess they were, they were shouting, all power to the ecclesia, to the assembly. That's where decisions were going to be made in the future. But I do want you to take seriously the notion of the making such a claim and doing so in heated circumstances that are revolutionary, because without that, <clears throat> it's inconceivable uh, that what happened would have happened. Now let me go back to the boule. It was elected by lot from proportional representation in the deans. All Athenians, Greek word for preparing legislation for an assembly is probulusis, and such a group is called probulutic. That is, uh, it prepares legislation. The chances are <clears throat> that this council was more powerful and had more independence when it was invented than it would later on. That's just a, a guess, but you know, you're at the beginning of something. There's still, you're still living in a society in which class distinctions are very clear and very sharp, <clears throat> in which the idea of the ordinary citizen taking things into his own hands is new and scary. I think there would have been a lot of deference paid <clears throat> to the individuals who came from the higher classes, and I would guess that they would have been on the list, preliminary list that, uh, that was elected before allotment selected among them, and that when they uh, proposed something to the assembly, it would be given greater, uh, sort of greater influence on what happened subsequently than would be true. When we get down to the full-scale Athenian democracy in the time of Pericles, <clears throat> forget about it. The boule is the servant of the assembly, without question. The assembly can, if, you, if the, if the uh, council sends in a proposed law in certain language, the assembly can vote it down, or they can send it back to the boule and say, no, we don't like those words, change the words into this direction and send it back to us. That's the way it was in the full democracy. My guess is it wasn't that way in the year 505. I think <clears throat> it probably was meant by Cleisthenes 
to be uh, a bit more conservative uh, without being, of course, in any way reactionary. Now, what is this all about <clears throat> in the largest sense? Lewis suggests that there's something here that is personal and political, and I think he's right. Uh, one of the elements that he suggests is these deems were not assigned to Tritias accidentally, <clears throat> as I've suggested already, but were carefully laid out not only to deprive noblemen of their uh, undue influence, but he thinks probably to help Cleisthenes and his Alcmeonidae to have a powerful voice in as much of Attica as he possibly could. <clears throat> Why in the world would anybody doubt that? That strikes me as being, so, I mean, that's what people do when they have the power to help themselves politically, they do. I would guess, in other words, Cleisthenes was thinking of his own political position in part. Again, we don't have hard evidence for this, but just a reasonable suggestion. Now, the other thing is, we have to, we have to I think, believe that the, this whole program of reform was supported by what we have been referring to all along, the hoplite class, these independent farmers. They are the ones who are most numerous. They are, I mean, among those who are, will be politically active. Also, they are, of course, the defense of Athens now, they have to be taken very seriously, and they are not about <clears throat> to allow themselves to be cut out or that, to have their own influence diminished by things that are hanging over from the days of aristocracy. <clears throat> and so I think we, we should think of this, most scholars, I think just about everybody does, this, they like to designate this Cleisthenic democracy, this first democracy, as a hoplite democracy. And saying that the hoplites were in means that to some considerable degree, the poor are out. The chances are very great, I would say pretty certain, that the majority of citizens, I'm sorry, yeah, the majority of Athenian citizens were not hoplites, they were thieves. There probably never was a time when the hoplites were a majority, even in Athens. So excluding them certainly is a limit on what you want to call democracy. And here's where we get into sort of the art, uh, debates uh, these days. Many, many a scholar, now that the, uh, uh, the academy is essentially a, a branch of the Politburo, um, will want to denigrate uh, ancient Athenian democracy <clears throat> and to suggest it really wasn't democratic. Well, there are 20 million ways you can do that. You can talk about the fact that it excluded women. You can talk about the fact that it, uh, um, who else does it exclude? Sla that it had slaves, excluded slaves, that it excluded resident aliens, uh, and all those things. And then you can finally point to the fact that probably the majority of the adult male citizens were excluded from some important elements in the, uh, the democracy, although as time passes, that last disappears and you have pretty much complete participation by the poor. But in Cleisthenes' case, that's not so. But I think that's to be deliberately blind to what's really happening. What you have is a miracle. Nothing in the world that we know of anywhere, ever, like this has ever been seen before. The reaction of the other Greeks, as best we can figure out, was horror. This is wild and crazy, the stuff that the Athenians are doing. It is radical. It is dangerous. We must contain ourselves and avoid being in, in touch with them, but well, we should try to finish those guys off. Certainly that was the attitude the Spartans typically had towards it, and undoubtedly the normal Greek government, which was an, uh, an oligarchy, certainly took the same point of view. So I think you can look at it from either direction, probably should look at them for both, but uh, don't miss the point that what's happening here is of this very special character. What did they call this constitution? Well, we don't know. 
but the chances are great that they did not call it democracy. The word democracy, our word democracy, comes from the Greek demokratia, which I guess you would want to translate as something like power for the masses, for the, the people at large, or the people as a whole. But it was a name that was given to <coughs> the Athenian constitution by people who didn't like it. What did they think of themselves? Well, Herodotus refers to this regime as one of isonomia, equality of law. And I think the, the thing that's most important about it is equality before the law. That is something that wipes out distinctions among classes of people on the basis uh, in, in when it comes to the law. Every man who comes before the law is equal to every other man. Well, that's a very big change that the, no place else in the world had. And <clears throat> I think that's not a bad way to think of it. And one of the principles that belonged from the first to this democracy uh, and was maybe as crucial as anything in characterizing it was what they called isegoria, Equality, well, equality of speech, really. It meant equality of the opportunity to address the political body, meaning the assembly. Every Athenian male from the first adult, who, um, regardless of what his money rating was, of his class, whether he was a feet or higher, everyone had the right to speak in the assembly. Now, this had been a right that was limited, of course, to aristocrats in many cities or to the wealthy in other cities. But we know from the, some of the poems in the, uh, fifth, in the sixth century, it was prized as the evidence of that an individual was a free man as opposed to a slave. He could get up in the center, that was the term they used, of the town meaning wherever the meeting place was, and then speak his mind and also try to persuade his fellow citizens to do as he thought best. We should not take this lightly. In our world, where we never imagine ourselves in such a situation, uh, it's hard to grasp. But actually to think, if I want to, I can get out there during the debate that's going to decide what happens, and I can say what I have to say. So freedom of speech, very, very central to, uh, uh, to the Athenian idea of uh, self-government. Um, the role of, of the uh, boule in place of aristocratic councils enhances the democracy. There, uh, on the other hand, things did not happen that you might think would happen. Nothing was done in the sphere of the economy. There was no change in Salonian classes or privileges. You still had to have a certain amount of money to be elected to the top things in the state. The Areopagus was left untouched, remaining a collection of former magistrates, all of whom had been aristocrats. The fratries, the home of aristocracy, were left intact. You had this hoplite democracy, which was indeed democracy, but we must imagine, I think, all the evidence would support this imagination that it was a deferential democracy in which the lower classes uh, still looked up to the upper classes for leadership and guidance, and they themselves did not hold leading positions in the state. I think that's the picture we have. Well, let me turn at last to one of the most, to, to my mind, one of the most interesting features of the uh, Constitution introduced by Cleisthenes gives us a picture of how things worked that uh, we wouldn't get any other, any other way. I'm talking about the law that was passed uh, on ostracism. Our word ostracism derives from it, but it's something quite different. If you, somebody says oh, we're going to ostracize this guy today, it means we're not going to invite him for a drink. We're not going to go to his parties, things like that. No, this was something far different and was a central part of the political system. <clears throat> Let me begin by simply describing how it worked. 
Every year, let us say in the month of January, that's the way the Athenian calendar would have made it come out more or less typically, a vote automatically came up, a, a, a question came up in the assembly automatically. Nobody had to move it. It was an automatic thing. The question was, shall we have an ostracism this year? Now, they could debate that question, but what they were not debating was, who should we ostracize? That was not an issue. The only question was, should we have one this year? And if a majority said yes, then they would go on. If the majority said no, that was it. No ostracism that year. But supposing a majority had voted for an ostracism. Now we go to roughly the month of March. And let's go down to the center of town, the Agora, which is the marketplace, which is the political center, which is where people go to talk and all those things. That's where the action is. And for that day and that day alone, the Agora is fenced off, and there are 10 gates in the fences, one for each tribe. And uh, every citizen who wishes goes with a piece of broken pottery. Someone has described it as the scrap paper of antiquity. <clears throat> and with whatever you could get, a piece of glass, a crayon, or whatever, you would simply write the name of a man that you would like to see ostracized that year. You would go to the gate. There would be some people at the gate who would, judge, if, would identify, are you really a citizen, where you come from, all that. You would hand it in your ostracon, and you went inside the agora, where you stayed until the voting was over so that you couldn't come back and vote again. Uh, they were cleverer than the people of Florida are today. Uh, so now it's over. The time has come. And what they do is they divide up all the ostraca that have been cast. And they don't divide them up, I'm sorry. They put them in a big pile and count them. If there are fewer than 6,000 ballots, nobody gets ostracized. If there are 6,000 or more, now they divide them up into piles. And the one who gets the most votes, not majority, just the highest number of votes, plurality. He wins. He gets ostracized. What does that mean? It means that he must leave Attica for at a certain distance from Attica, too, for 10 years. That's all. He has been accused of no crime. Therefore, he has been convicted of no crime. Uh, he, nothing is done to his property. Nothing is done to his family. At the end of 10 years, he may come back, and it's as though he never left. The next day, if he wants to, he can run for public office. That's all. That is ostracism. What's this all about? What are the purposes of this thing? Well, I think the best way to come at this is to tell you a couple of stories and some facts. The story, I guess, it comes from <coughs> Plutarch's life of Aristides, <coughs> who was one of the leading Athenian figures at the early part of the fifth century, and who, in fact, was a man who was ultimately ostracized. The story goes like this. It's ostracism day in Athens, and some country bumpkin, some rube, comes walking up, and he spots uh, Aristides chatting with some folks, and he. He goes up to Aristides, he says, excuse me, sir, I don't know how to write. Would you please write a name on this shirt for me? Aristides, of course, a gentleman. He says, certainly, sir. What name would you like? He said, uh, Aristides, please. <laughs> oh, he says, writes down Aristides. Hand it. By the way, he said, what is it that you have against Aristides? By, uh, I should have told you that Aristides had earned the sobriquet uh, the just, Aristides the just. So the guy says, uh, what, what have you got against Aristides? I have nothing against Aristides. I've never seen the man, don't know him. I'm just so damn tired of hearing him called the just. <laughs> the point of that story is to illustrate Plutarch's point is that um, uh, the, the system of ostracism 
was just a piece of silly foolishness that you would asso associate with democracy, which just allowed the jealousy of the ordinary man for superior people to determine what's going on. That's the message that Plutarch gets uh, from that tale. Here's another piece of information that's not a tale. <clears throat> I think it was about 1937, 38. An American archaeologist was working up on, on the north slope of the Acropolis, and he came upon a well. He dug into the well, and out came 191 inscribed potsherds, ostraca, with but one name written on all of them, and that name was Themistocles, who we, we know was a participant in a batch of ostraca in the 480, uh, ostracisms in the 480. And careful analysis of the handwriting indicated that these 191 ostraca were inscribed by 14 hands writing them. It begins to sound familiar to you guys, I suppose. It's the best guess of everybody who studies these things is that we do not have here the remains of a collection of voters who voted and had their votes counted and then these came up, but rather that these were votes that never were cast, actually. So what's going on here? Now I, I turn from my attempt at a factual account of what happened in the past to fiction. The rest of this is my imagination. And we find ourselves uh, down in the middle of Athens the day before the ostracism. We are in the home of uh, John the Potter, who is a charter member of the Aristides Political Club. And what they are doing is sitting about chatting as they incise or paint the name onto uh, an um, ostracon. The name is Themistocles. Next day, down there outside the Agora, various country bumpkins and others wandering into town, and you step up to one of them and say, uh, perhaps you would like to vote in the ostracism today, sir. I can save you the trouble of inscribing your ballot. Here's one right now. I think this is pretty good evidence that we're talking about organized political activities which in fact I think totally squares with what we know about the uh, uh, purpose of ostracism. Um, I should tell you one other thing, that Thucydides himself says something very important about this. He says ostracism was brought about because of the fear and the insecurity that the Athenians felt about their democracy, that it was in constant danger and that they needed something to help them. That's the context in which he views it. Plutarch, as I say, has a more general uh, uh, story, the envy and jealousy natural to democracy. You must have realized that hardly anybody who ever wrote anything in antiquity had a kind word to say for democracy. It is a, it's a bad thing from the standpoint of most of the authors of antiquity. But Thucydides was there while ostracism was a reality, as opposed to Plutarch, and uh, I'm sure he is right. <clears throat> Let's look, first of all, at the moment when ostracism was invented in the time of Cleisthenes, and before we move beyond that. What's the situation? Cleisthenes and company have just brought about this unique, amazing, and to the rest of the world, dangerous coup d'etat and invented this new, wild, crazy kind of government. They know that the Spartans are furious, and they expect they're going to come down any time. They also know that in Athens there are people who don't like this new government. Some of them are the heirs to the old aristocracy. Some of them are aristocrats themselves. Uh, others were very happy in the days of the tyranny. In fact, there are still relatives of the tyrants, eminent ones, who are uh, still in Athens. In other words, they have to fear uh, betrayal, they have to fear internal hostility, they have to fear people who might start a civil war, at the same time as they have to be afraid of the Spartans coming up the road. And we know, because in a few years this is going to happen, they have enemies of other neighboring states. Corinthians, 
the Eretrians, uh, others will uh, be oceans, Thebes. In, within the next five years, they will have invasions by those people as well. That's their situation. What are they afraid of? They are af afraid that there will be treason inside the city, which will help invaders or simply turn the city over to them. Well, then why don't they just lock these guys up? Well, in the first place, they probably haven't done anything yet, and you couldn't make a case against them. On top of which, you really don't, if you're Cleisthenes, you don't want to treat all of these people as though you, they are the enemies of the new regime. They are, in fact, natural opponents. The, the friends of the tyrants and the old aristocrats, they're on opposite sides of the argument. Why would you want to put them together by assaulting their leaders? A smarter thing <coughs> would be to try to win over one faction to support of your side at the uh, expense of the other. And that is my guess as to what is another explanation of what's happening here. So here's another piece of fiction <coughs> I want to throw you at you. <coughs> I imagine that uh, Cleisthenes uh, stops by at the house of Hipparchus, the son of Carmus, who is a descent, uh, relative of the Pisistratids and who would be looked to as the leading figure in that faction. And uh, uh, he stops by to see uh, Hipparchus, and Hipparchus says, hello, Cleisthenes, say, what is this routine? What is this crazy new law that you and your boys just put through, this ostracism law? Uh, I hear in the streets that it's aimed at me as the leader of the old Tyrannus faction. What is that? Cleisthenes, I imagine, would say, no, where did you get a crazy idea like that? I mean, that's, I'm, you're a swell fellow. I'm only against these terrible aristos out there and their Spartan lackeys who are going to take away all the people's rights. And I know you wouldn't want that to happen. That wouldn't be good. That's not like you. So uh, of course, I, I can see your point. I can see you are alarmed. I can see that people might say, gee, those old Pisistratus people might be trying to overthrow this new democracy and bring themselves back. I know Hippias is over there in Persia, supported by the king, and uh, maybe people would think you're for bringing him back as a tyrant. I know that would never be in your mind. But I tell you what you ought to do. Why don't you come over to my side? And I'll see to it. You know, I have friends. I got a lot of friends. I could do you a favor. Uh, you do me a favor, I could do you a favor. I could see that I would just kill that rumor and everything would be very happy. Next day, uh, all is well. Uh, and I think there's considerable evidence, I don't have time for it now, not, not certain, but evidence suggesting that Hipparchus came on board and became part of a coalition that ruled Athens for decades after that time. And so that year there was no ostracism because there didn't have to be an ostracism. I think that is very important. Most years there was no ostracism, only once in a while. And every single person that we hear ostracized was a leading political figure. Ostracism, in short, was meant to be a constitutional device to work in the political realm as a way of deterring uh, a coup d'etat, treason, or other forms of unrest. You could only use it as a politician if you were the popular favorite, if you were confident that the ostracism would go your way. If you held an ostracism and that wasn't true, you might find yourself traveling a long way from home pretty soon. And so that's the essence of ostracism. And we'll have a look at it again because it crops up and is used, but not for 20 years after it's invented. Okay. <clears throat>